Good afternoon. I'm Rick Griffin, and in behalf of the Constitution Week Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's opening address. On this date, 223 years ago, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, and the other delegates to the Federal Constitutional Convention sought to determine the final language of the United States Constitution. Four days later, on September 17, 1787, 39 of the remaining 42 delegates put pen to paper and signed that historic document. Today, we gather together to commemorate that signing, to celebrate our citizenship, and to learn more about the important role that the Constitution plays in our republic and the lives of each and every one of us. President Matthew Holland is with us today, and we've asked President Holland if he would introduce our distinguished guest, President Holland. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Griffin uh, for uh, his great work in organizing the events of this week and a number of our student leaders who are here. Uh, I uh, think we have a really rich lineup of speakers, uh, typically. I mean, all we're under obligation is to do something uh, at some point in and around Constitution Day, and we've got a week long uh, of activities planned that should provide uh, a lot of interesting and important discussion about uh, an issue that, that really matters. If I could uh, beg the indulgence of Dr. Griffin and Congressman Chaffetz, I would like to say just a word about uh, the Constitution and, and what we're doing. Uh, I was uh, uh, just reading through some, uh, some of the early writings of uh, Abraham Lincoln the other day in preparation for another event was reminded uh, uh, I'll share, this has nothing to do with Constitution Day, but it's funny, I'll share it with you anyway. Uh, the, the first words that we ever knew that uh, Lincoln wrote uh, kind of capture his uh, intelligence, a slight bit of irreverence. Uh, so the first, this is in his own hand, uh, he was probably about eight or, nine at the ten, eight or nine at the time, wrote, Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen, he will be good, but God knows when. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is my name, and with my pen I wrote the same. I wrote it both in haste and speed, and left it here for fools to read. Uh, well, it wasn't long before the, the young uh, boy Abraham Lincoln was a, was a fresh new politico in Springfield, Illinois, and gave um, an address uh, to a group much like this one, young people. Uh, it's really his first most important political speech in many respects of, of, any, uh, of any length. And uh, he argues that America will always be safe from external threat, not to downplay the difficulties that we face from external enemies, not that we shouldn't be vigilant, uh, but that if we were ever to die, it would be death by suicide, he said. And he asked how, what was the best way that we could fortify against it. The answer is simple, he says. Let every American, every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his posterity swear by the blood of the revolution never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country and never to tolerate their violation by others. As the patriots of 1776 did to support of the Declaration, so to the support of the Constitution and the laws. Let every American pledge his life, his property, and his sacred honor. Let every man remember that to violate the law is to trample on the blood of his father and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Let reverence for the laws be breathed by every one, uh, be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in the schools, in the seminaries, in the colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books, and in almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit, proclaimed in the legislative halls, and enforced in courts of justice. And in short, let it become the political religion of the nation. Let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay of all sexes and tongues and colors and condi conditions sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. 
Well, we could have a really wonderful discussion about just Lincoln's sentiment there. Uh, I think the kernel of uh, the thought there, though, is that the Constitution uh, is vital to our preservation as a nation, understanding it, following its precepts. That's the purpose of this day that's been uh, 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 arranged by our, our federal leaders to honor, and it's an honor to have one of our federal officers here today to speak about it. Congressman Jafin Chaffetz, Chaffetz was raised in California, Arizona, and Colorado. He moved to Utah in the mid-1980s after being recruited by legendary football coach Lavelle Edwards to be a place kicker for Brigham Young University. Jason drove to Provo with a few hundred dollars in his pocket and everything he owned piled into his car. At that time, he had no idea how much his experiences in Utah would shape his life. After earning a degree in communications and completing a successful collegiate football career, he married his wife, Julie. They have been married for 18 years and have three children, Max, Alice, and Kate. After spending more than 16 years working in the local business community in 2008, with no paid staff, no name recognition, and very little money, Jason beat the political odds. Standing on the principles of fiscal discipline, limited government, accountability, and strong national defense, he defeated a 12-year incumbent and was elected to represent Utah's third congressional district. In, in the District of Columbia, Congressman Chaffetz is known for his efforts to eliminate unnecessary spending. He even sleeps on a cot in his office while in D.C. to save the taxpayers over $1,500 a month. He is known for his support of the Constitution. As a member of Congress, he has a unique perspective on the workings of our constitutional republic. We are pleased today to welcome United States Congressman Jason Chaffetz. Well, thank you. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here. It's an honor and privilege to serve in the United States Congress. I, I tell you, when you walk upon the floor of the House of Representatives, you get that chill down your spine. And it's truly a remarkable thing, the history, the, uh, the weight, the opportunity that's before us as a nation. And you look around the room, it, it's, it's much like Jim Hansen said. He, he was served in Utah, uh, from Utah 22 years in the United States Congress. And he told me, these, he told me this would exactly happen, and it's true. You get there, and you're pinching yourself, and you just think, how did I get here? How did this happen? About, about six months in the, into that, you look around, and you're pinching yourself, and you're still saying, how did this happen? How did I get here? But at six months, you look around and say, how'd they all get here? You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, look, I, I appreciate UVU. Um, it's a special place in my heart. I served uh, on the board of trustees. Uh, was UVSC and then transitioned to UVU. I appreciate uh, Dr. Griffin inviting us here and, and participating. Uh, I appreciate uh, President Holland, uh, the great leadership that he offers this institution as it continues to grow and expand and become our state's largest educational institution. The number of lives and input and uh, uh, the number of lives that will be touched uh, is truly untold, and glad that you're all participating in, 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 that, in this process. But I, I thank UVU for giving recognition to our Constitution, probably the most important document that our nation holds. And so I'd like to share a few random thoughts. Uh, uh, hopefully you can see how it weaves together. We could spend days, weeks, years, and certainly there has been talking and thinking and exploring the brilliance and the miracle that truly is the United States Constitution. And I hope we teach our kids and future generations, because as President Ronald Reagan said, we're just one generation away from losing it. That it takes all of us to be involved. And, and to me, when you, when you look at this, this small little document, the concise nature in which it's put together, it is truly profound and, in my, in my mind, miraculous. And I like the way that it starts, we the people. That's probably the single most important thing to me, is that it's we the people. And as we look at what's happening around the world, and we look at other fledgling democracies, others that want to try to be like the United States, unless they get that part of the equation right, it'll never, ever happen. It truly has to be about we the people. Because it is the people of the United States that have been vested with this power. It's not a member of Congress, it's not some senator, not some governor. It's the people that have been vested with the power of the United States of America. Now, as I share some thoughts with you today, there's been so much that's been written that's so profound. I, I probably, unlike any other speech that I've given, will, will refer to some quotes. Um, people who I respect and people who have 
pontificated about this, so bear with me as I read some of these, but they're also fairly easy to find. And if you were to read the full context of which these, uh, these quotes were given, I think you'd come to even a greater appreciation of the profound nature of them. So, and again, we can only touch on certain parts of it, so I'd, I'd like to, to move forward with that in mind. I, uh, I truly do believe that it is, a, it is a divinely inspired document. This wasn't just happenstance that a group of people got together and came up with this document. I really do believe that. George Washington was probably the first one that we know of that used the word miracle. Um, in a 1788 letter to Lafayette, he wrote, quote, It appears to me, then, little short of a miracle, that the delegates from so many different states, states which states you know are also different from each other in their manners, circumstances, and prejudices, should unite in forming a system of national government so little liable to well-founded objections. Yeah, President Washington is probably one of my greatest uh, political heroes. And uh, I'm going to refer to him and President Holland, some of the words that he's written, Dallin H. Oaks, who's served uh, in a church capacity uh, here locally that a lot of people know, but also in a Utah State Supreme Court and uh, as an important attorney along the way, too, who served actually in a law firm uh, with my great uncle, uh, Hammond Chaffetz, uh, way back in the day, and uh, have some interesting ties that way as well. Abraham Lincoln, I love what he had to say. Quote, this nation, and one of the most famous sayings we've heard, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. You know, we always hear the of the people, by the people, and for the people, and that's proper. But let's also remember the first part of that quote, which is, this nation under God. We'll talk a little bit more about that. If you actually go to the Supreme Court and you actually walk through the halls. This is one of the quotes that you will see up on the wall. It's a quote from Cohen's versus Virginia from 1821. It says this, A constitution is framed for ages to come and designed to approach immortality as nearly as human institutions can approach it. Its course cannot always be tranquil. It's an interesting perspective so early in our, in our new course as a nation. But core, as I said, is we the people. Now there are, as you know, some amendments to the Constitution along the way, and I'm going to take the liberty, if you can, to talk about two of those amendments. Time would not permit us to go through in great detail any more than that. I'll, I'll even cut these a little bit short because, uh, because of the time constraints here. But I'd like to talk about the First Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. And um, let me just uh, start with the First Amendment, which obviously the first ten are part of their Bill of Rights. But the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. They, uh, there's a lot of talk and discussion about religion and its role in politics. You'll often hear the phrase, separation of church and state. I'm here to argue to tell you that it was our founders' profound vision and goal that we not void ourselves of discussion of religion, but that we not force that religion upon the will of the people. See, part of the reason that we actually have the First Amendment, part of the reason that we have established what we have established, is so that religion had the freedom to actually participate in the public square and those of religious mind or religious organizations could actually state those things with the freedom to share those thoughts and perspectives with others. We've had a lot of discussion recently about Proposition 8 in California. Very touchy subject. Very touchy subject. And I don't care where on the political spectrum you are. You may have voted one way or another in California. What I think is imperative to me is that we follow the Constitution which says Yes, religious organizations do have the right to participate in that political discussion. Because there have been a lot of churches, not just the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but a lot of churches that have taken a lot of heat for their participation in that debate. In Washington, D.C., I serve on a subcommittee within Oversight and Government Reform. 
I'm the ranking member. Remember, I'm, I'm just a freshman. And somehow they got named ranking member, which makes me the senior most Republican on this subcommittee that oversees Washington, D.C., which also dealt with the gay marriage issue. A lot of people have questioned why the local religious community, predominantly not the Mormon community, predominantly other, the Baptists and the Catholics and a whole bunch of other churches, have been so involved in the discussion about gay marriage in Washington, D.C., but I would argue that the Constitution not only allows, but actually sets forth and gives them the freedom to participate in those discussions. Voltaire in the 1700s was first quoted as saying, quote, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it, end quote. It is something that is so unique to the United States of America. And certainly there are bounds to it. I was talking to a great a fifth, a fifth grade class earlier today. It's talking about you can't run into a theater and it's dark and yell fire, fire, and cause such commotion that people may be trampled to death. There are some limitations, and I recognize that. But the freedom and the right of the people to assemble and petition their government is truly American. You know, I get a lot of questions about the tea parties. What are these tea parties? You know, who tea parties? That's such a catchy little name, and what's it like? And, I was just fascinated when this newspaper up here in Salt Lake was just attacking the very notion. And I went into this editorial board meeting and I said, gentlemen, sorry, there were no ladies in there. Gentlemen, you should be applauding this. You may disagree with what they're saying, but you should celebrate the fact that they are people uniting, getting up out of their seats, and they're participating in our political process the way they're supposed to be doing it. There aren't guns ablazing. There aren't bombs going off in our streets like you see in other countries. You have people getting together, getting up out of their seats because they don't like the direction of the country. And that's what our Constitution provides the opportunity for them to do. So you may not agree with the Tea Party. You may disagree with where they stand on a particular issue. Then get another group of people together and have that debate. That's what freedom of press is all about. That's what the First Amendment is all about. Now I want to talk about the. I want to go back to the religious component because this creates as much contention and discomfort for people. But to me, I, I, I smile and I celebrate and I, I think this is our country at its best. I believe we are truly one nation under God, and that we should not shy away from that. We seem to be so politically correct that people are worried about mentioning the word God about actually saying it aloud for fear that we may actually offend somebody. And while I want to respect people's um, hesitation on that, I don't think we should go so far as to try to deny it. If we were to deny that, we would be de denying the very history of our nation, the very foundation of our country. And I can go to countless numbers of examples from the founders themselves talking about this very, very thing. In George Washington, I'm going to use a couple different quotes from his farewell address. He said, quote, Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. I'm read that again. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. If you go throughout the Supreme Court, you go throughout the halls of Congress, I haven't been in the White House as much. I don't know if they have as many quotes. I've been there a few times, but I, I, not as much as obviously I'm going to the House of Representatives. You know that off the floor of the House, as you make your way between the, the Senate and the House, and you're right, they have what's called the Speaker's Balcony, which is right off the rotunda. If you were to go directly to the West, there is actually a prayer room intended for members of Congress to go and pray and contemplate in a moment of prayer, whatever religion they choose. But to try to suggest that our country does not have some sort of religious background, that there should be no mention of God, that there is not a religious context, would be to deny our nation its true and rich heritage. I want to talk, uh, use a quote here, a long quote, longer than you normally use in a talk, but I think he says this so profoundly. And I he uses this from Dallin H. Oaks because he used this, this quote, again, as, as a legal scholar, as somebody who worked in the, at the state Supreme Court for the state of Utah. 
And this is uh, it's part of the discussion about Proposition 8 as it relates to, again, the viewpoint. I'll let his quote speak for itself, but it's rather long. Quote, a second th threat to religious freedom is from those who perceive it to be in conflict with the newly alleged, quote, civil right, end quote, of same-gender couples to enjoy the privileges of marriage. We have endured a wave of media reports charging that Mormons are trying to deny or strip people of their, quote, unquote, rights. After a significant majority of California voters, 7 million, over 52%, approved Proposition 8's limiting marriage to a man and a woman, some opponents characterized the vote as denying people their civil rights. In fact, the Proposition 8 battle was not about civil rights, but about what equal rights demand and what religious rights protect. At no time did anyone question or jeopardize the, the civil rights of Proposition 8 opponents to vote or to speak their views. The real issue in Proposition 8 debate, an issue that will not go away in years to come, and for those whose resolution is critical to what we protect, everyone's freedom of speech and the equally important freedom to stand for religious belief, is whether the opponents of Proposition 8 should be allowed to change the vital institution of marriage itself. The marriage of a union of a man and a woman has been the teaching of the Judeo Christian scriptures and the core legal definition and practice of marriage in Western culture for thousands of years. Those who seek to change the foundation of marriage should not be allowed to pretend that those who defend the ancient order are trampling on civil rights. The supporters of Proposition 8 were. Ex exercising their constitutional right to defend the institution of marriage, an institution of transcendent importance that they, along with countless others, others of many persuasions, feel consciously obligated to protect, end quote. And again, in the midst of a, of a longer discussion. The point I guess I'm trying to say here is there are going to be some in this crowd that would have voted in favor of Proposition 8. There would be those in this crowd that would have voted against it. And there are probably many more of you in this crowd that probably wouldn't have voted. Um, but what the point I'm trying to make about the beauty of the Constitution is our ability to speak, but not to hold back based on some political correctness, but the ability to speak and be able to, to lean on somebody's own religious viewpoints. That is a valid constitutional um, precept by which people can make and discern and make that type of decision. And it should not be shunned from the political square. It is the history of our country, it is the future of our country, and it is guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States of America. Let me, let me move now to the Tenth Amendment, probably one of the more underutilized amendments in the, in the, the course of our country. And uh, let me just read the Tenth Amendment because it is so clear, it is so succinct, I would hope we would all truly understand what it means. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. All too often, there are overuses of the Commerce Clause and overuses of the, um, the, gen yeah, the General Welfare Clause. Between the two, you can pretty much make up any excuse you want to do whatever you want. What we have to be so cautious of is that the federal government was never intended to be all things to all people. In fact, it was a very conscious decision that the Constitution was to limit the role of the federal government. We weren't supposed to be all things to all people. And there are those of us in con Congress, I count myself as one of those that stands up and says, the federal government probably shouldn't be doing this. They probably shouldn't be doing this. I had a, uh, there's a freshman member of Congress who serves with me. He's, uh, his name's Tom Rooney. Uh, Tom uh, represents uh, uh, Central Florida area. Uh, he's a freshman Republican who's very conservative in his approach. Uh, he comes from the Rooney family, owns the Pittsburgh Steelers and whatnot. Anyway, he's just a great guy. And we have this meeting once a week where a group of conservative people kind of get together and we talk about bills that we're introducing and whatnot. So I'm sitting next to Tom and, and I said, Tom, what do you got today? And, uh, you know, more often than not, you have, you know, you're not presenting a bill. But he said, oh, I got a bill. I said, really, what's your bill? It was a resolution. And he said, you know what, I'm kind of embarrassed that we're even having to do this. 
but it's a resolution recognizing and supporting the Tenth Amendment. I mean, had things gotten so bad in Congress that we actually had to run and sponsor a resolution saying we actually support the Tenth Amendment? But it was amazing. That thing went around the room. Not everybody even signed it. It was just a resolution saying we support and stand up for and believe in the Tenth Amendment. We have trouble in Congress even doing that. It's a sad, sad commentary. I am part of what's called the Tenth Amendment Caucus led by Congressman Rob Bishop. There are those of us that believe that the federal government should be giving up its powers and giving more back to the states. It's not to say that there isn't a federal or there isn't a governmental role in many of these items. It's to say that the federal government is not in the best position to do that. We have uh, several examples of things I think that we need to re-examine. We have a thing called No Child Left Behind. I, don't, I want to repeal No Child Left Behind. In my mind, there shouldn't even be a Federal Department of Education. We were talking earlier today about the, uh, we were talking about the Transportation Department. And uh, some of the, what is the value add that we get from the Federal Department of Transportation? We collect the tax here in Utah, send it back to the federal government, the middleman, who then sends a portion of it back to, the, to Utah to say, okay, this is where you're going to spend it. I mean, oftentimes that money comes back and it's given to trails and other types of things. Our gas tax? I think more and more the state legislature is going to have to look real hard and close. And not just by default, accept every federal dollar. I think we're going to have to take more time examining whether or not we should actually accept the federal dollars. Now, I want to make sure that there's a way we can also exempt ourselves out of having to pay for much of this stuff. But the Tenth Amendment is there and put into place specifically to limit the role of the federal government. That's what we were worried about as a nation when we started. But tell me an area where the federal government isn't a participant, where it doesn't regulate your life. That's the concern. Now, nearly 25 cents, and it fluctuates, okay? Historically, if you look at our gross domestic product, our federal government spends roughly 18 to 20 percent. You look at the budget projections out of the Congressional Budget Office, we're upwards of 25 percent for the next few decades. Think about that. 25 cents out of every federal dollar, every dollar that goes to the economy, 25 cents is going to be spent by the federal government. That's just unsustainable. We have added, uh, since Barack Obama took office, there are now more than 130,000 additional federal bureaucrats in the system. 130,000. Now, that doesn't count the census, doesn't count the post office, doesn't count the military. These are federal bureaucrats that do what? Wake up every morning and try to figure out how to regulate. That's how they justify their existence. We've got to create more regulation, more instead of getting back to the core of what we're supposed to be doing. And clearly, there is a federal responsibility for much of what the federal government could and should be doing. Our national defense. That's what we should be focusing on. There's so many things that we're actually supposed to be doing, but so many things that we aren't supposed to be doing. That's what the Tenth Amendment's about, and that's where we're going to have to stand a little truer and a little taller in making sure that we actually implement that along the way. I have an interesting perspective that happens. I, uh, oftentimes when you're debating things in the, the floor of the House or even more so in the committee meetings, I've heard this argument so many times, and I haven't been there a very long time, okay? But I've heard this time and time again. Well, we'll do that, and then we'll throw it to the courts, and then we'll find out if it's constitutional or not. That is not the oath of office that I took. The oath of office requires each and every member of Congress and the House and the Senate to also uphold the Constitution and not try to let something get through the process under the, well, we'll let the justices figure that out. I can give you, I can give you one example where I took some heat and uh, I'm glad to do it because I think our delegation has changed. When I was running for office, all five members of Utah's delegation were supportive of Washington, D.C. be giving voting rights in the United States Congress. The idea was, back in earlier this decade, is that, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give Utah an additional seat in the House of Representatives, and that way it'll balance out, because you'll probably be a Republican, 
And what we'll do is we'll give the Democrats a seat because if we give Washington, D.C. voting rights, you may remember we've all seen their license plates, taxation without representation, you know, it's on their license plates. So what we want to do is we want to give voting rights to Washington, D.C., but just in the House, I promise the bill that we're going to run, the one that was sponsored by multiple people in our own delegation, said that they would not get senators, they would just have a member in the House of Representatives. Right now they have a delegate. It's Eleanor Holmes Norton, and she is able to vote in committees. But if hers is the deciding vote, then you can pull out this rule and read this thing, and, and it, her vote doesn't count. And, uh, and so then they said, but we'll do this in the House. All five members of our delegation supported this notion. This was one of the great early tests for me because uh, I'm on judiciary, I'm not an attorney, but I was a, I'm on the House Judiciary Committee, and there's this great picture I will cherish for the rest of my life, because I am sitting this close to Steny Hoyer. Now, Steny Hoyer is the majority leader. He's been in Congress for more than three decades. He's a great-looking, gray-haired gentleman. He looks very distinguished. If you think of a Washington, D.C., you know, distinguished politician, that's what he looks like. And I'm sitting over here just young, you know, I'm like, oh, I, we, I actually get to testify in front of the committee? I didn't know we get to do that. So I, I sat down there, and I know, I know, I know he thought that I was there to testify in support of the bill that he had signed on to to give Utah a seat and whatever and, and to give Washington, D.C. a seat. So we're chit-chatting. I introduced myself. I was young and fresh there. And he gave his opening remarks. And I'm sure could have left. He's the majority leader. Uh, but he sat around for, for, for a moment to kind of hear what the rookie had to say. And I said, with all due respect, this is a political bribe. It is unconstitutional. The, Washington, D.C. is not a state. Representation in the United States Congress is given solely to the states. And I will not participate. Oh, my goodness. You, he is so fuming at me. And I just thought, you know what? Here it comes. This is the test. And I had members of our own delegation irate with me. How dare you embarrass us? I said, gentlemen, it's real easy. If you want the residents of Washington, D.C. to have voting rights, then retrocede them, as we had done earlier on the other side of the river, retrocede the residential areas of Washington, D.C. into Maryland. Because guess what? The people that are currently residents there, they should not only have a member of the House, they should have two senators, a governor, and a state legislature. So if you want full representation, you're not going to be satisfied with one member in the House. And how dare you solely give Utah seat, that's just a political bribe. You're only giving it to us because we're Republicans? That's insane. We're going to get that seat anyway come 2012. So why would we play in your political gamesmanship? Oh my gosh, the whole place. Anyway, bombs are going on. He's blowing up the place. And I thought, this is fun. I love being here. This is great. <laughs> and so I got out and I read the Constitution and whatnot. And anyway, we beat that thing back. And... Um, that was, a, that was a very proud moment. But it's, it gets, it's illustrative of the point that everyone involved in that process is supposed to stand for the constitutional duties. It's not just the Supreme Court. It's not just left to nine people. I'm going to end on this thought, and then if we have a few minutes for some questions, I'm, I'd be happy to let President Holland answer them. That'd be great. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes I get this question, not a lot, but sometimes, and I, I think it's something that you, you should ponder too, because I, I heard somebody ask it in one of the Senate debates, and I thought, ooh, I wonder if I, how I'd answer that question. I thought, I better think through that, get through that answer. Um, and uh, the question was, who is your favorite founder? And to me, one of the most inspiring things that I've, I've seen is, is President Washington. Now, for a whole variety of reason, reasons, I mean, it's pretty easy to, oh, Washington, Lincoln, you know. But there's a reason why, through generations, they have been such inspirational, uh, inspirational figures. I saw something that was really touched me um, and, and was really impactful. And that was when I had a chance to go see our troops who were fighting in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and visit with some of our National Guard and some of our troops and whatnot. It was really interesting because I, in, in Iraq, uh, I got to sit with General Odierno. You know, General Odierno, he looks like Shrek, you know, the big bald-haired guy, you know. He's been there for five years leading the charge. I mean, this is guy is as tough as nails. 
and uh, has a perspective that we all should appreciate. And uh, I'm a little disappointed the president, when he gave his address from the Oval Office, didn't recognize the contribution of General Odierno. Nevertheless, um, he's seen it all. And I, and I said to him, I said, what's your number one concern? What is for the peaceful transition of Iraq back into the hands of the people of Iraq? What is your number one concern? And without hesitation, he said, I don't know that they understand or appreciate um, the peaceful transition from one government to another. That is, they had elected their first set of representatives. But what was going to happen to the country when all of a sudden somebody lost? Maybe somebody was in power, and then they lost that power. Would they simply hand the keys over to the next person? Or would they say, I didn't like the way that went. I think we need another election. Or, I'm not, not giving up my seat. I don't care what you say. We take all too for granted this peaceful transition. There may be some grumbling. There may be some, uh, but there won't, there is generally in our country a history of peaceful transition of power. And I think that was in large part led out by President George Washington. And President, you should read his book, but President Holland talks about this in, in his book, you know, and, and there's two parts to this, but if you look at George Washington and his stepping down from power, but then you can also look what was happening with Adams and Jefferson, because that was really probably one of the first truest choices that our, our nation needed to make. And there was great contention. There was worry that, you know, people were literally like hiding their Bibles. They were scared to death that what if, you know, what if Jefferson won? What if Adams won? I mean, people were truly scared about this transition of power. But I think the example that President Washington left after two terms and saying, I can still be patriotic, I still love my country, you don't need me. It goes back to that, for me it ties together the whole we the people. So I want to read a fairly long, and he uses some language that isn't as common today, so if I slaughter some of the words, my, my apologies to. But these are the words of, of President Washington. Quote, not unconscious, in the outset of the inferiority of my qualifications, experience in my own eyes, perhaps still more in the eyes of others, has strengthened the motives to diffidence of myself. And every day, the increasing weight of years admonishes me more and more that the shade of retirement is as necessary to me as it will be welcome. Satisfied that if any circumstances have given peculiar value to my services, that they were temporary. I have the consolation to believe that while choice and prudence invite me to quit the political scene, patriotism does not forbid it. It is important, likewise, that the habits and thinking of a free country should inspire caution in those entrusted with this administration to confine themselves with their respective constitutional spheres, avoiding the exercise of powers of one department to encroach upon another, Think Tenth Amendment. Think Tenth Amendment. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one, and thus to create, whatever the form of government, a real despotism. A just estimate of that love of power and the proneness to abuse it in which predominates the human heart is sufficient to satisfy us of the truth of this position. The necessity of reciprocal checks in the exercise of political power by dividing and distributing it into different depositories and consulting each the guardian of the public wheel against invasions by others has been evidenced by experiments ancient and modern, some of them in our country and under our own eyes. To preserve them must be as necessary as to institute them. If, in the opinion of the people, the distribution or modification of the constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by an amendment in, way, in the way which the Constitution designates. But let there be no charge by usurp usurpation. For, those, for though this is one instance, may be the instrument of good, it is customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. The precedent must always greatly overbalance in permanent evil, any partial or transient benefit which the use can at any time yield. 
To me, that is so profound in the idea and the notion that we don't entrust all the power into one. We disseminate, we, we push that power out to the states that it really truly is about we the people. That it's not incumbent upon any one individual in order to execute that, but it's truly incumbent upon all of us to have that executed. There have been very few more profound words than those of President Washington. We need to learn and follow the example of those who have gone before us. We need to be careful, careful. And I think we have not been careful enough. I think we have overstepped our bounds in the overreaching arm of the federal government. There is a role and responsibility in the federal government. But let it be noted that we all have a personal responsibility to make sure that we uphold the Constitution at every level. I cannot thank you enough for allowing me to serve in the United States Congress. It's truly, truly been an honor. And when the phone rings and my time's up, I will pass the, the baton. But to be able to serve in that capacity is, is truly an honor. And I, I can't thank you enough. I, I appreciate you listening to me for so long. And, May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. We'd like to thank Congressman Chaffetz for speaking today. We have time just for a couple questions. Um, Congressman? The question is, you know, is Utah doing anything particular? And we have a representative from us, Mike Morley, who's here. I'd love to have you pepper him with that question as well. Um, the Utah does do a few things, I think, pretty well and probably better than other, other states. Um, and part of that is because of our state constitution. You know, we have, we're a better managed state in part because we have a limited uh, time in which our legislature meets. The 45 days really limits the discussion and forces the discussion to things that are most important. The other thing that I think they, that is, is uh, imperative to our ability to be a well-managed state is the constitutional, uh, the constitutional imperative at the state level for a balanced budget. That also forces the discussion and, and makes it swiftly so that by the time you get into March, you have to make some decisions. As far as um, determining whether or not we accept certain monies. You know, we had this discussion about the $101 million for education and whatnot. I, I was telling some others earlier, I had an opportunity to, to sit with one of the Supreme Court justices, and I'm sorry to tease you with that and not tell you his name, but um, I asked him this question about the, the 10th Amendment and how do, how do states stand up for themselves, and he, he was really quick in answer. He said, you gotta stop taking their money. Stop taking the federal government's money and you'll have more control over your own destiny. Now. The thing that's imperative to me that we got to be real careful of is I also want to exempt us out of having to pay for it. It's one thing to be able to say, oh, I won't take the money, but if you have to pay for it, then I think it changes the equation. What I hope the state legislature does into the future, and I think will become more challenging to the fiscal analysts and whatnot, what is the cost of taking that money? The example I used earlier is No Child Left Behind. In our state, and this number is a few years old, I'm going to have to get an updated number, but it's a couple years old, but it probably hasn't changed that much. Our state budget on education, about 8% of that comes from the federal government. So if we have No Child Left Behind, for instance, what is the cost of implementing No Child Left Behind? So a dollar in doesn't mean you get a dollar's worth of value necessarily. What is the true cost of that? And so I think that will be one of our ongoing battles because I see no slowing in the federal government, and that, that's one of the concerns. So how do you stop that? Well, maybe sometimes every once in a while state, the, the state legislature is going to have to stand up and be united and say, eh, not going to do that. One of the immediate things that I think we're really going to have to be united on, too, is deals with the public lands. Uh, the overuse of the Antiquities Act, I think, going into the first quarter of next year is really one of the great threats to, to the Intermountain West. Um, you recently had Secretary Salazar coming here and pretty much you know, 
foreshadowing a, uh, an announcement from the administration that they're going to grab millions of acres of federal land, and I, that scares me. So we have not been as united as we should be between the legislature and our congressional delegation in saying, no, we are not going to part. You are not going to do this here in Utah. So. One more question. Oh, oh sorry. Did you have somebody? I was going to say this guy in the back there. Um, I was just wondering if you could uh, briefly describe your plan to help repeal the No Child Left Behind. <sighs> Got to get enough votes to get it knocked down. I mean, it, that's, the, that's the hard part. You, you have a um, leader, Boehner, who's potentially going to be the next Speaker of the House. His piece of legislation was No Child Left Behind. Um, what's interesting to me about No Child Left Behind, particularly from a Utah perspective, you get a room full of Democrats, you get a room full of Republicans, you're pretty much going to, I mean, I say that line about we should repeal No Child, everybody cheers. Because it's the teachers on the front line that actually know how cumbersome it actually is to actually implement it. Um, it's not that we don't want to educate our kids, it's just who's in the best position to make those types of decisions. And that, to me, is, you know, we just have to keep making that argument. What I see is this unparalleled expansion I want the dollars to follow the kids. I, I, I mean, we all talk about wanting to spend more on the pupil. That's great. But what have we done? We've added 500 new bureaucrats to the Department of Education in just the last few weeks. Average annual income, by the way, is $100,000 per person. And that doesn't count their benefits or retirement. So I'm on the subcommittee that oversees federal workforce. I get to see these numbers as they come along. It's just unbelievable. Um, I am concerned about that the federal government as a whole does not have the political will in order to say no to anything, uh, let alone a big program like that. I'm going to give you, give you a quick example. I sit on a small subcommittee that oversees the National Archives. Archiving is in this country. You're going to learn more about archiving than you ever wanted to know. Archiving falls into three categories, humanities, arts, and the National Archives. You watch National Treasure, you know what National Archives is, okay? We spend in this country in excess of $800 million a year archiving things. Now, if you look at their mission statement, they're supposed to be focused on archiving of federal records. So we go into the subcommittee, and I'm telling you, there are not as many people as there are in over here. It is an open meeting, but just nobody cares. It's archives, for goodness sake. Who's going to come to Washington and see saying, ah, I've got to go to that archive meeting, you know? just doesn't happen. Well, they have a grant program within National Archives. And the grant program is $10 million a year. So I offered a bill after seeing the list of what they give archives uh, grants to. And I said, we got to repeal this thing. This is ridiculous. The International Tennis Hall of Fame, the ACLU, Princeton, Stanford. I mean, these, these are not institutions that need federal dollars, your dollars. So I offered a bill to repeal it. Well, the chairman of the committee, a gentleman from, Chairman Clay from St. Louis, offered a bill to double the program. He wanted to take it from, he wanted a five-year authorization and double it from 10 million to 20 million. I'm the only Republican that shows up to this meeting, which is not uncommon, okay? It's not uncommon on both sides of the aisle, not just the Republican side, but not uncommon that few, very few members show up. And I made as much hooting and hollering as I possibly could. I mean, at the top of my lungs, just saying, this is so wrong, it's so wrong. Think about what they were trying to do. They wanted to take this from 10 million to 20 million over five years. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a hundred million dollar authorization on a silly, stupid program that none of you have ever heard about it. And the problem is there aren't dozens of these, there aren't hundreds of these, there are thousands of them just like this. The International Fund for Ireland, we send as a government your tax dollars, right? That's the consideration. We're gonna pull that money out of your wallet and give it to somebody else. We send Ireland $14 million a year. So I went to visit with the ambassador to Ireland. I said, what is the International Fund for Ireland? Why? And he said, we discontinued the program. I said, well, what do you do with the checks? He said, we cash them. <laughs> last year, last year, Ireland got 15 million instead of 14 million. And there isn't one member of Congress that can stand up and tell you who, that, I asked, that they asked for it. So I'm just beating the pavement as loud as I can and saying, okay, the, international, the, the mohair subsidies, Back in the World Wars, we would give out a million dollars a year to people who grew and gorn goats because we needed mohair for our military uniforms. We haven't used mohair in a military uniform since the Korean War, and we still hand out a million dollars a year. And so to get to your question about repealing something big like that, 
I figure, you know, if we can't get rid of the International Fund for Ireland, the Mohair subsidies, and grant programs for the International uh, uh, Tennis Hall of Fame, what are we going to get rid of? And I think that's our collective challenge for the Congress. Because these big weighty issues, like Social Security reform and everything else, they get punted down to the side. And meanwhile, all these programs that started with good intentions never stop. And it's your money. It's our money. That's why we're paying five, six hundred million dollars a day in interest. And we can't do the things that would truly help people and their families. That's what's so sickening. You guarantee you, you have relatives, you have friends who are out of a job. Because our country is somewhat paralyzed in the ability to grow economically. In part, it's because our federal government is way overreaching. And we're doing too much. So I could go on. Now you got me rolling on stuff. But the time is late, and uh, I do appreciate your indulgence. Please study the Constitution. Have your kids study the Constitution. Get to know it. Refer to it. It's an amazing, amazing document. I, I thank you for having me here today. I really do. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank the congressman for speaking today. Please come and see the rest of our activities this week. Everyone have a great afternoon.